Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest in the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Umer Javet on the line, and he's founder and CEO of Texel. Umer, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Adam. All right, Umer. So I'm excited to learn more about Texel and really how you're helping your clients. I'll tell you, um, this is one of my favorite topics. For those that have been watching, uh, that have been watching the show for a long time, they know that like we we believe highly over here at Mission Matters in outsourcing teams and leveraging dynamic talent worldwide. And uh, as a company, we're not huge, but we have talent in in many different countries. And uh, excited to learn about what kind of things you can offer to the audience and, and us, really, when it comes down to it. But before we get started um, with that, we will start this show like we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, Umer, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Umer, what mission matters to you? So, on a personal and both at a company level, I've been through and through a talent guy. So what matters to me most is to find the best possible opportunities for talent and for those opportunities, the best possible talent. So anything that can help talent in any way is something yeah. that matters to me the most. Fantastic. L- love bringing mission-based entrepreneurs on the line to share why they do what they do, like what motivates them, what gets them out there and going, because we all know um, being a business owner or being in business is not easy. So awesome having you yeah. on the show. Um, just to get us kicked off, and um, for those that, I mean, we know we, we know just for context, we're recording this in the very beginning of 2022. Um, lots of changes in the world going on over the last year and a half, two years, really, um, feels like, uh, and everything's shifting, like how we, how we source talent, um, what we use um, to grow our businesses, how we leverage the expertise of others. I feel like everything's changing now. Um, from your vantage point, I mean, what kind of things are you noticing in the talent market? So I think uh, IT industry in general, I would say, while the world stopped, the economy stopped, uh, yeah. IT industry is generally the beneficiary of the COVID. So all the digital yeah. acceleration we were thinking of going to happen, like, let's say in the next 10 years, yeah. uh, people need it now uh, and at a very fast pace. Now, to make this digital transformation, you need a lot of people. And uh, all of a sudden, not those many people are available, which means the world will become, world has become much more open to find talent anywhere uh, they possibly can. I mean, so they are not no longer looking for a guy sitting next to them on the next table. They are open for to find talent anywhere in the world. That has, uh, in my view, I mean, the whole the whole thing, the way, in a way, the way entrepreneurs are searching for talent, they are ready to accept remote people in their teams. They're ready to work uh, with entities who are not in their geography. That has changed a lot. Mm-hmm. And there's a search for talent uh, demand. And there's, a, uh, I mean, there's a search for digital transformation. I have, I have a bias on this subject. I'll be upfront. Since we, since we started this company, we were remote and we've just been so fortunate to work with um, great companies like yours and others that do outsourcing to really make sure that um, that that we're growing and we're doing it in, uh, in, in an efficient way, but also bringing on, um, you know, people that are, are really good at what they do. So I think yeah. something used to exist, and, and I'll say that I had this bias, I won't say everybody else does, but to pick on myself here, um, you know, I always thought that, you know, they had somebody that I was hiring had to be in my city or I have to see them, or I have to kind of watch them. And that was my misunderstanding as a business person to think like that's what it had to do to get the job done. Now, though, um, just just for example, like one of our best project managers, he's in the Philippines, like one of like my my right hand uh, woman, she's in the uh, she's in um, Argentina. Like we have salespeople in, in London and these individuals are absolutely amazing at what they do. So I feel like the world has gotten smaller for talent in a little bit. And I feel like this gives us all the opportunity to like the, the rate of innovation, the rate of how we get things done is just kind of exceeding. Like, do you think this this kind of trend, like where do you see this going? Yeah, I mean, this is this is an absolute trend. 
uh, people who who uh, people like yourself or even me who wanted to see their teams next to them they are now pretty fine working in a hybrid model and i would say it's more like the world has really now coming to terms and really understanding what is an integrated global team means i mean you can have a cluster of people at one place another cluster at another place even some uh, working just as an independent out of uh, their homes or uh, home offices or, or, or co-working spaces mm-hmm. and you have a global team. So, I mean, we used to have this understanding of follow the sun model where big companies, I mean, the, the production stops at one point and another uh, region takes over and then another region takes over. And it used mm-hmm. to be a concept for bigger enterprises. I think it's, it's not a concept for every company of any size. Uh, having great integrated teams, go find the best talent that you can at anywhere in the world. Better mm-hmm. if you can find them in cluster. If they come together at one place, great. And then you can have a great set of distributed teams. So if so, when you're asking about trends, yes, this is absolutely the trend that I'm seeing. And mm-hmm. it's uh, just increasing by the day. Okay, so I want to break this next part into really two two sections, if you will, and I'll explain. So there's people that will watch this that they're brand new to outsourcing. So they're very, they're just getting started. Then there's people that are out this that have been outsourcing for years and a little bit more sophisticated. So let's yeah. kind of break this conversation up a bit. So let's talk first to the people that have never outsourced before. What should they be looking at um, in terms of like a contract or a company or like as they begin this journey? Because it's not easy when you first start. Like it's easier now, I would argue, than when we started five years ago doing this. But like because things have accelerated. But just to get them started, what are the, some of the things that they should be looking for when they're considering a company? So, so I think successful outsourcing, and I've been in this business for the past 13, 14 years, yeah. uh, it has to me, uh, some very distinct characteristics, and I'll come to that. But for newbies or companies who are new to this business, I think their best bet is to really go and find out uh, companies, uh, other companies in the different region. They are, they are essentially fi- trying to find a partner who can integrate th- uh, with them well. So while uh, while doing their search, and there are platforms available out there, and there, there are companies who are doing marketing. I mean, every company receives Ten, I'm sure tens of emails or messages every day in their inbox uh, to see the, of, of various outsourcing services companies. Now, mm-hmm. now really, uh, the, the the thing that comes at this point is how to really select one of them. And mm-hmm. obviously, you have to go through an interview uh, process, a selection process to really find the right company. Now, if a right company exhibits certain characteristics, I can, I mean, you can go on their website, you can go on their social media, LinkedIn, so find something authentic about them. You you get that feel of being there. They're authentic. They have the real people. They'll have yeah. their customer references. They'll have, uh, they'll their, their social media pages will be showing up their culture and whatnot. So I think it's very important to see uh, about a partner that are you getting to the, I mean, instead of finding individuals, yeah. Go find the right company in the beginning. That's very that's very important. Now, when you go and do a contract, mm-hmm. try to understand that as much as you are nervous about the contract, the other yeah. party may also be nervous about the contract. So uh, try to treat this contract in a uh, in a way that you would treat a local contract. I mean, you want mm-hmm. to build your protection, but you also want to build their protection. And the more visibility that you can create the better it will be. So for instance, I mean, there are things that you should be very much aware of as if you are a, a US company trying to find uh, some outsourced partner in Asia or Europe or, or in other parts of the world. Yeah. I mean, you'll be better off if they have a US legal entity for that matter, mm-hmm. because then you have some, as I said, you have a throat to choke or an entity to yeah. sue. Uh, I hope the things don't uh, go that bad, but you yeah. at least have a legal contract that you can enforce. Uh, you should have being, uh, you should have your NDAs and non-competes in place. A lot of the time, the problem with with the developing countries is the lack of IP protection, lack of yeah. uh, uh, respect for no compete, etc. So, working with a mature company gives you that kind of protection. So, you sh- you need to be knowing that you're 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 doing a contract with a US entity, you are or or an entity in your region. You yeah. have IP protection. A no compete built into that. You know, understand that this is a work for hire arrangement. You, at the very outset, lay down your requirements of let's say 
time zone overlap, IP protection, etc., security, and so on and so forth. Then comes the second part, which is about building uh, safeguards for you as well as for your vendor. I think I've yeah. seen too many mistakes over there because a lot of companies, they just want to create a contract that can get them out as quickly as possible of a situation if it goes uh, if it goes south. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that you see, if I give you a contract, Adam, I said that I can I can just disconnect this show at any given time. Yeah. And you have an audience that you would like to serve for let's say 30 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, you will be kind of whether he's <laughs> the right guy, whether I should have yeah. a show with him. And you'll be building unnecessary safeguards. You may not be giving your best shot to me. Mm-hmm. So what I tell uh, to customer is that while you uh, you try to evaluate the company you're working with, mm-hmm. go for a hard evaluation, ask questions, see what they are. Even you can ask them for meetings as well. Then give them the visibility of the contract or, and build, yeah. your, uh, build your clauses that you would like to protect yourself, but give them visibility. So, I mean, don't give them like a one week exit clause if you intend yeah. to do a for an year, because in that they will not bring their A game for that one week contract. Mm-hmm. If they know that any contract can, can expire in a week or so, they will not bring their mm-hmm. A game to that or bring their A players for that. So tell yeah. them how the opportunity is give them the visibility on that contract so uh, if just to re-emphasize uh, maybe uh, have a contract with a US entity mm-hmm. make sure your IP and no competes are, are in there make sure that you have clarified the demands of uh, time zone overlap communications make yeah. sure you have built an appropriate visibility in the contract for both of you and there is a get out clause for both of you but if you can give them visibility do give them visibility Hmm. So uh, first off, thank you for that insight. I mean, that was very detailed. And I think a lot of those tips and things that you mentioned, um, those apply obviously to people that have been doing this for a long time. Like some of the things that you mentioned um, might have to reevaluate some of our contracts and things that we've done with companies, but we've been fortunate. But in the beginning, we were we had some bumpy times just because we didn't we weren't as experienced in this. So I think all the information you gave very valuable. Um, is there anything that you would say kind of speaking directly to those advanced people? The, so, the, so the people that already have teams and they're looking to continue to add other sources of talent and they may have been using outsourced teams for years. Anything that you would say to them? We are in a software development space mm-hmm. and a lot of my information will be relevant to that. And I'll come to that, how you, re, how, how you should go about doing a successful software project or uh, yeah. building a successful team. But uh, uh, but let me uh, uh, take this opportunity to help uh, a number of experienced CTOs understand mm-hmm. something that I've been uh, kind of trying to uh, uh, evangelize for quite some times. So so many times there's a problem that occurs that you have just hired a team outside and uh, you want them to perform um, or behave in a comparable level uh as your in-house team Mm -hmm. but you really don't want you really don't do stuff to them that you do with your in-house team so Mm -hmm. let me help understand what i mean over here Mm -hmm. i mean when you hire an entity uh with whom you are working and ask them to give your team what essentially you are outsourcing you're Mm -hmm. outsourcing your infrastructure to that entity, you're outsourcing your recruitment pain to that entity, mm-hmm. you're outsourcing your operations pain to that entity, you're mm-hmm. outsourcing some of your organizational level motivation, career path planning plan pains to that entity. Yeah. But what you're not really outsourcing, uh, you are essentially want to get the performance out of the person who is now part of your team. Mm-hmm. Now imagine you have someone in your team sitting right next to you mm-hmm. and uh, what do you do with them? You tell them about the vision of the product. You tell them about yeah. the mission of the company, the values. You do one-on-ones with them. You do skip yeah. level meetings with them. You do their technical assessment. You do their technical coaching plan. So yeah. I felt, and you also tend to incentivize them in a different way. I mean, sometimes you give them mm-hmm. stock options and whatnot. So what I feel that over the years, the best CTOs or CIOs that I've worked with whose teams have very, very minimal turnover rates or mm-hmm. who have a highly motivated outsourced team, they mm-hmm. tend to treat these outsourced team in exactly the same way they are treating their mm-hmm. in-house. Uh, so 
they do the one on ones they do the skip mm-hmm. sessions they do they tell them why their work is important that yeah. keeps them motivated just beyond their paycheck so i mean yeah. while the entity you are working with they have done every single thing this extra thing that you do probably mm-hmm. like uh, an hour for a week yeah. that gives you a performance boost of let i mean it's 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 like a night trade gives you an x uh, an x performance boost uh, so that's yeah. that's kind of my suggestion or advice to experienced CTOs or CIOs yeah. that you have a team outside treat them as your you want them to to work like your team so treat them like your team oh man I, that is such an advanced level tip that is obvious but it, it like well, after you hear it, it's obvious what you just said. But I would argue like many people don't do it, number one. And I'll tell again, talking about our journey, um, you know, when I in the beginning of this, I didn't I didn't know that. So I made some mistakes there, too. And then one day I woke up and I'm like, wait a minute. We're not even the fact that we're referring to, you know, this particular team or some of these individuals as VAs or outsourced or things like that. I'm like, that's not right. Like not not. It's just that was creating two different cultures. And once I kind of personally realized that um, and then once I as the business grew and things changed, I, I looked up and I'm like, wait a minute. Some of those teams have been longer. They've been with us longer um, then our, then our, you know, onshore employees or whomever else. My first like customer, uh, we, uh, we got them back in like 2008. They still mm-hmm. work with us. Like uh, they have a team working with us and, and eventually they do not have an in-house team and this team is still working with them. Yeah. And, and there are people in that team that have spent like, I mean, this is yeah. like, an alien thing in a software world, but there are people who are in that team for like over six, seven years. So wow. they have a lot of their knowledge base and whatnot. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's very important. Also, one thing, uh, Adam, that you uh, mentioned about the first time uh, uh, kind of entrepreneurs who outsource. Uh, one mm-hmm. thing that I would like to tell them is that uh, is the alignment of expectation of what they are getting. It's really not about mm-hmm. the first time outsourcing. It's about understanding the software development process yeah. and what you're really hiring. So what I've seen is that when CEOs mm-hmm. uh, of small, medium businesses and all, they, they try to outsource, they expect that engineer to do everything. I mean, yeah. you, you, you are constructing a house. It's like you're constructing a house yeah. and you, you don't want to hire an architect. You don't want to hire mm-hmm. an interior designer. You want to you want, you have an engineer or a mason and you expect him to do everything right so that doesn't happen mm-hmm. which means that if you are a first time uh, entrepreneur who is mm-hmm. outsourcing and you're trying to uh, build a team it's it's mm-hmm. good uh, it will be helpful if you have someone inside your company who talks mm-hmm. tech and then don't expect to hire an engineer and they do every single thing uh, yeah. on their own remember yeah. they are not sitting next to you they are mm-hmm. not aware of the context there is a communication gap involved so you may need a business analyst you may need a product manager you may need mm-hmm. a user experience guy and then comes the point where you may need an engineer uh, who mm-hmm. can translate every single thing into an actual application so this is this is some, this sometimes i feel not for the first time People who outsource, but with CEOs, they they tend to hire one guy and say, "This engineer, yeah. he why can't he really think of all the requirements <laughs> that I?" Have? <laughs> the poor guy doesn't have the context. Oh, I, I love that you say this. And the thing is, is that's a little bit of a bias that people have to get over. It's like you wouldn't do that if some of you hired somebody and brought them in your office. So you can't do that to somebody else. Like they're not going to know everything they want. And then it might be outside the scope of what they're hired to do. And they're not and like it's not when you hire a person or a couple of people, it's not like, hey, make my problem go away. That's not the way it works. It's an extension of your business. I love that you bring the. I feel like this interview Umer is just basically us talking about all the mistakes I've made in outsourcing so our audience can listen and learn. <laughs> Everything you've said, I've probably made that mistake in the journey. But for the record, like I, I love that story you said about the team being there since 2008. We still have, and I'll give him a shout out, Julius, which is our, he now leads our back office for the podcast team and uh, and, and a lot of the production. He's edited over 3,000 of our episodes with, between him and his team. And he's the second person to ever edit an episode after when we first started ourselves um, and I was doing the editing so years ago. So um, I, I'm just saying that as a testament that if you get it right, if you're working with the right company and if you really 
take this seriously, like you can have really good long term results with what you're doing. So that that's so my one, 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 one more one more uh, <laughs> one more mistake that you may have done or you may not have. But I've seen I probably that. did. Go ahead. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that often happening is really is a lack of product manager. I think that's one of the key roles that I've seen missing. Uh, when uh, companies try to do an outsource project, so yeah. so what what really happens is uh, one of uh, a lot of time I've seen this complaint that yeah. I want someone to take up my idea and run with it. The, the these yeah. poor guys cannot do that. They are engineers. Yeah. They need set of instructions. Put, yeah. Push this button. Pull this lever. Do this and so on and yeah. so forth. So uh, the difference between a failed project and most often a successful yeah. project. Is there is someone doing the product management role? Mm. Uh, a product management is uh, very different from project management. Mm. A project management deals with the scope, the timelines, the cost. A product management really deals with what you really want to build. What are the priorities? And mm. uh, getting it them to a stage where an engineer can take them over and build it. So let's say you want to build a product and you have fifty different things to build. Mm-hmm. What what are the things that you need today? Uh, somebody needs to talk to sales. Somebody needs to talk to the C level. Somebody needs to talk to some someone else in the company to find out what is the right pro- or customer. What are the right priorities to build today? And what are the right features within that priority to build today? And what can be left to maybe two months down the road? So mm-hmm. this product and 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 then telling it to engineers that what they really need to build and mm-hmm. what will constitute a satisfactory build. I mean, this this is important. And the product manager is a guy who really does that. So when my experience, what I've seen is that the difference between a failed product or project or a successful project is very often the product manager. And Adam, I would like to emphasize over here, you, you really, really talked about the first time entrepreneurs yeah. that uh, if you're talking to a company, Mm-hmm. who is not coming across as a thought leader giving you all these suggestions run away as far as you can mm. because they cannot tell you i mean everybody is after getting more business but yeah. let's assume you are a ceo i know you have uh, some hundred thousands or million dollars to spend i mean let's yeah. say a few grand to spend for that matter and all I want is to take that money. And I'm not telling you that, hey, Adam, if you do not have a product manager, somebody needs to fill that role or your yeah. product uh, project is going to miserably fail and will have a better exit. Uh, mm-hmm. So if I'm not telling you that, I'm not educating you as my customer, mm-hmm. I'm really not the right company to work with. So mm-hmm. the right companies are those who can tell you on your face that you need this. Otherwise, this is not going to work. And if somebody doesn't know that, I think mm-hmm. they're really not the right company to work with. It's awesome. Um, And and I didn't make that mistake. So thank you, (laughs) Umer. So I want to, I want to switch up a bit here. Uh, So let's go, let's um, spend some time on Texel and, and what you do. So I guess first off, of course, working in outsourcing, but tell us more specifically, tell us about the company, please. Yeah. So, so we are uh, uh, a company that has like more than 500 engineers. We have, Mm -hmm. uh, we are located out of three geographies, U.S., Europe and Asia. Uh, our the team, the way we split our team is essentially into practices. Our largest practice is around bespoke software development. So uh, we, you come up with a set of requirements, you come up with a uh, a product idea, and we help you build that. Uh, another, some of our practices are around our solution uh, implementations like uh, Salesforce, UiPath, ServiceNow. So if you're a large company. Uh, we can come in and instead of building everything from scratch, we'll implement a solution for you. Yeah. A third practice is really around uh, innovation. So if anything is uh, uh, is really hot in the market, you can count on us that we have a decent sized team around us. So two of the key practices that we are implementing and pushing forward are, are AI and machine learning, as well as uh, blockchain. Uh, we uh, we have done a number of pro- uh, products and projects in that uh, even raised money along with our customers in that. So bespoke software development, solution implementation, AI machine learning blockchain. Yeah. Uh, and and as we as we segment them, bespoke solutions and innovation. So these are the three key areas in our company work. In terms of the way you can engage us, I mean, uh, 
uh, as we say, we are more now geared towards talent and talent management. So, yeah. so we you can you can you can engage us in a model where you kind of uh, hire a team with us, or you can ask us to build your offshore development center for you, or you can uh, uh, give us a project. So it's a mm-hmm. fixed fee, it's offshore development center, or it's your remote team. We also have uh, pretty interesting models in working with startups. I mean. A number of our customers are uh, are startups for whom we are building products. That's why there's a large bespoke software development team, mm-hmm. and uh, these are Series A, B, C funded startups uh, yeah. uh, run by X, Amazon, Google, Facebook, CTOs, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, we can build these uh, products for you, but we also have. Uh, some interesting models to work with you as well, which means if you are a great uh, CTO or a CEO and you have an interesting idea, we can co-invest with you in the form of equity uh, for exchange. Mm-hmm. And uh, and once you get to the funding stage, uh, we can have a different business model. So, I mean, uh, we, we, we love working on challenging problems, mm-hmm. building up solutions that can scale, and we love engaging in one way or the other with you, be it giving you talent, be it uh, taking all your pain and building out a product from for you and uh, yeah. deliver you the end end product or end to end solution without involving you much. So whatever works for you. So this is this is the Excel in a nutshell. Uh, four or five hundred engineers working out of three geographies, being uh, very often recognized as among the top companies and various uh, uh, public uh, publicly available sites. Up. Mm. In terms of our customer base, startups, mid-size, and even enterprises. So enterprises are typically our customers of our solutions, like Salesforce. Mm-hmm. Uh, medium-sized companies are typically the companies which gives you a project. So I want my mm-hmm. insurance management systems to build, or I want XYZ oh. to build. And then there are startups who are looking for typically a bespoke product. Mm-hmm. I want this AI machine learning based dense scanning application. I want yeah. Uh, a replic- I want to build a uh, rep- auto replenishment mm-hmm. e-commerce platform that can power uh, companies like Walmart or uh, yeah. Edison's or, or whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, so this is this is kind of stuff we do. So Umer, um, you mentioned you know blockchain AI. I think you said machine learning. So you've been in this business a long time. First off, just outsourcing in general. Like as you see this trend continue, I feel like just the capabilities and things that can be done um, are they've just changed. Like and whether it was just perception or otherwise, but it's just changed. Like when you say use the word innovation, like you're not just saying that. Like you're you're working on cutting edge stuff. Can you talk? Yeah. I know I'm not talking about any specific project or anything like that, or, you know, client confidentiality, NDAs. I don't mean that, but I mean, like, can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of like in the market and development and things like that, just in general? So, so I feel, I feel the software development or solution implementations is still the large uh, mainstay yeah. and companies and with all this digital transformation. So AI machine learning mm-hmm. to work, it needs digital transformation. It needs a lot of data. Only then a machine can learn. Mm-hmm. And the reason of uh, recent surge in AI machine learning and talk around it because we have more digital data available that that machine can use to, I mean, that that software can use to learn. And that's where the machine mm-hmm. learning coming in. So while AI machine learning was considered as an innovation, mm-hmm. I think, it will become it's it's moving mainstream and will become more and more of a building block of every application that we do. It's much like I mean now login or kind of fingerprinting is uh, as a or 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 kind of face recognition is like a building block of any login stuff. Similarly, AI machine learning on its own will not be uh, creating innovative product, but will more and more become mainstream and will be part of. Uh, a layer in every single product. So that's my kind of view of AI machine learning. We are still uh, some distance from that, but that's where it's heading. In terms of blockchain, I mean, uh, crypto is an interesting <laughs> word. And uh, most uh, most of the people, they know crypto, uh, I mean, they know blockchain uh, from Bitcoin. Uh, so that's that's I mean one use case that that really uh, made it famous. But blockchain as a technology uh, has a lot of value, and uh, more and more use cases are emerging. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean we are seeing some of the fastest growth in our blockchain based mm-hmm. teams. I mean in terms of number of personnel they are needed and number of uh, products that are coming in. And with this Facebook announcing Metaverse, I mean we have really I mean 
we just ended up creating a separate entity uh, with over 100 people that yeah. is doing large play to earn games based on blockchain and crypto yeah. model and uh, and uh, and and creating adjoining metaverses around that i mean because this is a product that we own as equity partner as well mm-hmm. so if you can go to web and see nitro league this is a uh, a racing car metaverse that we are uh, creating and uh, we raised quite a bit of money around that but i mean coming back to your question mm-hmm. i can see a lot of growth happening in the blockchain and uh, crypto space it's still i would say early days but mm-hmm. i can see a definitive growing trend and i think it's going to get bigger and bigger yeah well, Umer, uh, I just have to tell you, it's been great having you on the show. I know, I know you, um, you got a lot going on, um, a lot of people you're managing, companies growing. I know that, re, I mean, it's just in high in demand. Everybody's looking for outsourcing right now, as they should be, as they're, and, they're, and they're looking for different ways to um, be competitive in the marketplace. So I just have to ask you, I mean, what's next? I mean, what's next for you? What's next for Texel? So Texel aims to be the largest, our service as Wenger aims to be the largest a tech talent pool that you can tap into yeah. uh, a highly pre-voted tech talent and we feel as a tech cell that we want to get into any business and every business that works around talent be it uh, creating demand for that talent be it creating supply for that talent so if the companies out there are looking for top top tech talent i think and we are right now very well placed at and we are going to kind of grow like 10 to 100 times very quickly and become the most premium uh, tech talent place around. So that's, mm-hmm. that's I can see, the future of Texel. Uh, we initially thought it to be a technology accelerated. I think it's uh, going more and more in the direction of talent, knowledge accelerated as a company. Fantastic. Well, Umer, um, again, awesome having you on the show. If somebody's listening to this or watching this and they want to learn more and they want to connect with you and your team, um, what's the best way for them to do that? So www.texel.com, info at texel.com. Feel free to add me over LinkedIn. Reach out to us on info at texel.com and we'll surely respond back. Perfect. And we'll put all that information, the show notes and all that good stuff when this goes live. So people can just uh, can just click on it and head right on over. And if this is your first time with us at Mission Matters, um, we're a platform that's all about showcasing entrepreneurs, executives and experts and really having them share their mission. Like, why do they do what they do? Like what wakes them up in the morning and gets them fired out there, uh, fired up to go out there and uh, and really just be of benefit in the world and in the marketplace. If that's the kind of uh, content you like, don't forget get to hit that subscribe button because we have many, many more uh, mission-based entrepreneurs coming up for you and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Umer, really, it has been a pleasure and thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you for having me.